This is WCM's Park Update, a weekly show covering the outdoor hospitality industry hosted by Ben Quiggle and Mike Gast. During each episode, you'll hear from special guests and campground experts on topics that will help your park flourish. WCM's Park Update is a production of Woodall's Campground Magazine. Hi, I'm Ben Quiggle, editor of Woodall's Campground Magazine, and this is another edition of WCM's Park Update, sponsored by New Book Reservation Systems. And, uh, of course, my colleague Mike Gast is with us, a former Vice President of Communications at Campgrounds of America Incorporated. And our guest today is Jeff Bakey, who is Managing Director of CHM Government Services. And you guys are based in Massachusetts, right, Jeff? Yeah, we are. We're just north of Boston in Ipswich, Mass., but our team's pretty much scattered all over the country, Ben. Okay. All right. So uh, how's the summer been out in Massachusetts? I know when I talk to some of the eastern states, they say it's been a little wet this year. Uh, wet would be an understatement. Uh, we have seen more than our fair share of uh, rain this this season. Uh, it yeah. started early and it really um, has progressed throughout the summer. And unfortunately, in the Mid-Atlantic and up in the New England area, uh, a lot of those storms coincided with the weekends, which yeah. also was uh, impactful to anybody that was trying to plan, you know, a vacation, you know, let alone you know, something uh, in the outdoors. Jeff, why don't yeah. you run us through a little bit about what, what CM, uh, CHM does and a little bit of your background too. Sure. Um, so my background, I've got about 35 years of experience in the uh, hospitality and recreation operation and advisory industries. Um, private sector, went to hospitality school uh, at the University of Denver, Um did a lot of operations related work in the food, beverage and hotel industries and evolved into an advisory capacity with one of the uh, big six accounting firms back in the day. Um, the, the practice has evolved. We've always stayed focused to, to the both the private and the public sector. Um, and it's and it's evolved into a more, I would say, laser focus on the public sector. We saw a real business opportunity um, some 20 years ago as the sophistication of the industry was increasing to support our public sector clients who may not have the training and or experience in hospitality and recreation. And so um, those opportunities took us to a lot of the federal land management agencies, state land manage management agencies, as well as um, the DOD. And uh, so we're, we've been working actively with uh, the Air Force and the Army and uh, and, and the Navy. So. Um, Great, great set of clients, but and, and really appreciate the expertise we bring. Um, but we're we're very much a boutique consulting and advisory practice, Mike. I mean, um, although we've got a team across the the country, we're small, we're nimble. Uh, we have anywhere between eight to ten dedicated full time employees, but we ramp up through a bullpen of subject matter experts and subcontractors that are thirty to forty deep at any point in time. So there's not really an asset class or a situation that we run into where we can't bring the appropriate expertise to render the advice and and and, uh, and and advisory services that we need to for our clients. Yeah. Um, so I guess, you know, we've been hearing a lot about new funding sources for a, a lot of the public parks. I guess, how, what is it, how has that impacted what you guys do? Um, have you guys been pretty busy with consulting and, and diving into a ton of different projects when, when you look at your public portfolio, I guess? Yeah, um, you know, we uh, obviously experienced a pretty significant slowdown during the pandemic. Um, a lot of our federal clients um, put many of our contracts on ho on hold. Um, but uh, since really the last half of 2021, uh, we've seen a continuous ramp up in our volume of work um, mm -hmm. that has resulted in an expansion of our team. Um, and it really is across the portfolio. I mean, we're continuing to do a lot of work with the National Park Service um, in terms of leasing and concessions, uh, as well as strategic advisory work as they look more strategically at their portfolio uh, and how best to manage funding um, projects and the timing of those projects. But we're also seeing a lot of activity across our state park portfolio. Uh, we're involved in, in many uh, planning efforts. Um, advisory efforts and asset management efforts across many state park systems. 
Um, we've also recently got involved um, within the the sovereign nation industry. Um, you know, our Native American um, partners, yep. you know, have have looked to expand their hospitality and recreation portfolios, especially around their gaming assets. So we've gotten involved with quite a few um, nations in terms of how, how best to be looking at the hospitality portfolio. So it's been very active um, and, you know, we're very, very pleased uh, that it's active and it beats the alternative that uh, we experienced in 2020 and 2021. So Jeff, yeah. do you get involved in the, uh, in the operations themselves or just on the consulting side? No, strictly on the, on the advisory and the asset management side. A lot of times, Mike, will get asked to source management um, and, and evaluate and provide an opinion on which management company or what operator might be appropriate for a particular business opportunity. And, and the only time we really get involved in the quasi management side is as, a, as an owner's representative. So we may get hired as an asset manager owner representative because our client may not be as sophisticated as they need to be to understand the nature of the business. So we sit as the owner's rep and oversee the manager or the operator. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I guess, you know, uh, when you're consulting with a lot of these groups, I guess, what are they, what are they looking for? Maybe on the amenities side, what are you know, are you noticing more public parks getting deeper into the amenities now? I, I mean, on my end, I notice a lot more installing yurts and installing canvas tents and doing these partnerships, I guess, is that kind of a new trend? Yeah, I think, you know, I mean, the pandemic really shifted the pendulum of how people look at, you know, outdoor recreation and hospitality. Um, you know, across our portfolio, there's a lot more scrutiny to um, quality and condition, um, improvements in amenities, whether, you know, that's on the utility side or that's on, um, you know, the bricks and mortar side. But um, an elevation of the overall experience is really kind of what we're seeing, a trend in expansion of amenities uh, where there may not have been, you know, restrooms or, or showers or laundry facilities, improvements in the utilities, as I had mentioned, improvements in the sites themselves. Um, and, and the other thing that we're seeing is really a, a more strategic look at the composition of experiences that um, our clients are offering their, their visitors and guests. And it's not to say that, you know, they're avoiding, you know, the existing inventory of sites, but they're looking at how best to complement those sites with other uses that um, might appeal to, you know, the outdoor hospitality industry, whether that be, you know, camping cabins or, you know, yurts or, or the glamping experience, but really just a much more critical look at how best to diversify their offerings. So do you run into conflicts with uh, with the private sector that may be surrounding some of these public sectors when they when they see this as unfair competition? You know, I I, um, I, I don't see that specifically, Mike, although, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sure it exists. Um, you know, there's there, we're kind of protected and insulated our markets. Um, <clears throat> and so I think, you know, a lot of the improvements you know, it's one of those things where I think the market overall is looking at elevating the experience. And with that elevation, um, it's just overall better for, you know, the entire industry and the entire operator and visitor experience. <clears throat> so can the public side really keep up with the private side? I know we've seen a lot of big money coming into the camping business this last year and a lot of consolidation in the private side. Yeah, you know, um, the private side can be so much more nimble. Um, and do things so much more quickly than the public side can. Um, there's so many more requirements, whether it's, you know, an environmental assessment or a NEPA requirement on the public side, you know, especially as it relates to our federal land management agencies. The states are, are a little more nimble, but there's so much political scrutiny um, overall that it's just it's much more difficult for them to react as quickly as the private side. So a lot of times they're, they're chasing the, the, the private side of the industry in terms of um, not only the pace of improvement, but also the evolution and innovation of improvement. Yeah. How, you know, um, what's that, you know, what's the feedback you guys do get when from the public? Are, you know, are they generally on board with, you know, all of the new things that state and public park, you know, state national parks are doing, or do you still get, you know, is it still rough? You still get some rough feedback from these communities sometimes where these parks are located, I guess. 
Uh, well, you know, there there's certainly scrutiny, um, and I think the intention, the underlying intention of everyone is to, you know, play well together. Um, but everybody's looking after their own business initiatives. Um, although the private sector can resist, push back, be vocal, um, you know, at the end of the day, the public sector, whether it's the feder feds or the states, you know, have an interest in complementing, not competing, but also driving their guest experience. And I, I think mm -hmm. it goes without saying that, you know, a lot of our public sector clients subordinate their returns and their revenue, you know, to preserve, protect, and to provide favorable and high quality guest experiences. So although I'm sure there's some pressure on the private side, I think it's mitigated a little bit because of the mission and the subordination of revenue and returns to the government so that we're, we're not really providing an unfair competitive landscape. Do you yeah. uh, have any, any numbers or any surveys that show how quickly the, the federal government exactly is going to increase the amount of sites available? I mean, that, that the inventory is, is a problem across the industry, but I, I would think it's, it's especially acute in these popular national parks. Yeah, you know, it's interesting, uh, Mike, that you should bring that up. Um, there's no hard and fast data about that, um, you know, and it depends on who the client is or who, the, you know, who, who, the, who the land management agency is. Um, you know, on the federal side, like I said, it's very difficult. It's very complicated. Um, and in the short term, I think many of our federal land management clients are looking at how better can they recapitalize their assets through maybe a shift of ownership or a shift in how they look at managing. Um, and so as opposed to self-management, maybe the park service would look at a concession contract instead of um, self-management in the forest service, maybe they look at, at a lease structure that allows them to free up capital through an operator that might improve the experience and the overall uh, product that's being offered. On the state side, um, you know they're 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 a little more quick to move. Um, they also have all of those tools, leasing, concessions, management contracts available to them. Um, we're seeing some of that um, in the state side, but there's there's no real expansion plan um, at this point in time that you could put your finger on. It's more an internal look of how do we deliver a better product and better manage what we have. Yeah. All right, well, we're going to take a break for a minute and recognize our sponsor, New Book, and we will be right back with Jeff after the break. Calling all campground operators, owners, front desk heroes, and more. Say hello to your show sponsor, New Book, your connected hospitality management solution, packed with the power to streamline your operations, maximize revenue, increase bookings, and deliver books memorable guest experiences thanks to its suite of innovative and easy to use tools backed by an expert customer support team cheering you on 24 7. so if you're ready to level up your campground and unlock more opportunities head to newbook.cloud to start your journey today hi welcome back to wcm's park update and we are chatting with uh jeff bakey the managing director of CHM Government Services, and uh, we're just talking a little bit about the, you know, some of the differences between the public and the private sector, and and how the public sector is adapting to camper demands of different things. I guess, are you noticing more government, like state government agencies, looking for more private public partnerships, maybe than in the past? I, I know. Uh, we've seen some different ones with like some glamping groups and like even on the concession. And I guess, is that something more government agencies are looking at? Yes. Um, I, I would say that um, they are availing themselves to entertain um, different operating models. And, and it really relates on kind of where, you know, their assets are in the life cycle um, of, mm -hmm. of maintenance and, and capital reinvestment. And so um, they are availing themselves more, I think, now than than before um, on alternatives to self-management. And, um, you know, the Park Service has always been very ingrained in, in the concession concessioning of their assets and have a long history of successfully doing that. 
But I do think the states now are, are much more open to the concept of public-private partnerships. Um, there's obviously a political landscape that needs to get um, to, to be navigated. Um, and there's, you know, constituent groups there that are keenly aware of and sensitive to job loss. And so yeah. um, a lot of what we do is educating and saying that, you know, bec just because you, all, you know, entertain some of these other business models, operating business models, doesn't mean that all your employees are going to lose their jobs. In many cases, they're going to get hired by the new entity. So it, it's, um, it's, it's an evolving trend, and I think it's, um, it will continue to evolve, but it does require a lot of education. What about on, I know a lot of the feedback I read about when we post our news for Woodalls is, uh, you know, the public, the, the, the people are worried that, you know, the, these companies may come in and, and hurt the environment at the parks or, or damage or, or, or restrict access or whatever. Do you hear that on your end, I guess? Yes, we do. Um, you know, obviously, all of these land management uh, entities are hypersensitive about resource protection yeah. um, and sustainability. And um, a lot of times we'll get brought in um, to evaluate kind of what some of their options might be to continue that preservation mission and, and accelerate or how best to manage that preservation mission. And a, a lot of times we'll get involved with looking at um, not only the regulations, uh, the underlying legislation, the regulations, the policy that's involved behind resource protection um, and sustainable business practices. And we look at their contracts. Um, and oftentimes through a review of their contracts and the supporting exhibit to their contracts, we can put more fire to the feet of the operators um, towards the mission of preservation and sustainability. And we look to do that a lot of times through what we refer to as an operating plan, which could be an exhibit to a, a formal contract that really spells out um, the responsibilities of the parties, not only the operator, but also the state or the Fed or whoever else. Um, and through that document, which is a living document that could get updated with the mutual approval of the parties, you know, we can bring um, you know, innovative methods or specific requirements towards resource preservation and sustainability to the operation of, uh, you know, a third party type of a contract. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I mean, it, it's amazing. Some of the things that are going on right now in the industry and even on the public side, it's amazing. I, I think here at Woodalls, we see all the time, different stories that come in where, you know, parks are adding sites, they're expand, you know, they're expanding to some degree, they're adding sites, they're adding glamping units. It's been really unique to see how some of these public parks are working with private groups that are setting up glamping tents and glamping yurts and, and doing different things like that on public sites. So uh, just trying to meet that camper demand, I guess. Jeff, what, what's the, what's the status of reservation systems on these public and, and, and you know, the state and national facilities. I know there's been a lot of uh, pressure put on and, and, you know, everybody's waiting in line to get their, their favorite site. What's the future hold for that? Well, that's a very good question, Mike. I mean, you know, on the federal side, we've got, um, you know, rec.gov, which continues to manage the lion's share of the reservation load there. Um, I think they do a good job. Obviously, there's always room for improvement. Um, but we've worked with those guys before and, and they continue to enhance their product and respond to, uh, you know, visitor reactions and uh, and demands. You know, on the state side, um, you know, there's no central platform. You know, a lot of the states are looking to create their own platforms, whether it's through Maestro as a property management reservation system um, or others um, and, and, and looking at how best to create the overall system to best manage the park. And that could be, you know, aligning and integrating, you know, a reservation system, a property management system, a point of sale system, and how you get all those systems to talk to one another. That seems to be the biggest challenge. Um, and, you know, as advisors to the industry being brought up on the, on the private sector side, you know, we're always very sensitive to financial reporting, operational and financial reporting. And how do we achieve that operational and financial reporting in a uniform system of accounts for the hospitality industry that then our clients can benchmark their performance against. 
And that yeah. is a big hurdle in trying to get all these systems to talk to one another, to report out in a way that allows for that benchmarking so that management can make real-time informed decisions about shifts in priorities, how they're performing and how they might shift the strategy. And that seems to be one of the biggest challenges I think um, many of the states face right now um, relative to that whole reservation integration with property management and point of sale. So Jeff, was the, uh, was the advent of the entry reservation system your idea? You know, at that at Glacier and other places where they've, where they've limited the amount of people that can actually get into the park mm -hmm. during the day? No, I'm not going to take that credit, Mike, but, um, you know, we have been involved. We've been involved at Muir Woods. We've been involved at Haleaka, Haleakala and Hawaii um, in terms of how best to underwrite um, and structure the rules of those systems. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, with with few exceptions, they 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 address the objective that the National Park Service wanted to put in place in terms of managing crowds. Um, I, I don't think that's going away. Um, I think we're going to probably see some more of that at some of our more congested parks um, in that, you know, the, some of the post COVID numbers that we were seeing were just unsustainable in many locations. Um, and so there has been talk about, you know, how best do we manage those loads, you know, mm -hmm. again, with that eye towards preservation and resource protection. Um, how, you know, I think on the reservation end too, we've been seeing a, quite a few stories about, you know, people hogging a ton of different sites and, and like booking 20 sites and only using two and doing, doing weird stuff like that. Have you been uh, hearing that on your end? And, and, you know, what's, what's the, I guess, public parks are taking some action, I guess, what's the solution to all of that, I guess. <laughs> well, you know, that's, that's never been, you know, that's not a new problem. Um, yeah. You know, we saw that back in the private sector, hospitality industry, specifically the lodging industry, you know, 20, 25 years ago. Um, people, you know, play in the reservation systems. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot, I don't, you know, that's not going to go away, Ben, but I think that there are steps that can be put in place to better manage that, whether um, we're shortening the cancellation window and requiring, um, you know, a fee to be paid. Uh, on a cancellation, cancellation within a certain, certain window. window. Um, um, so, so, you know, I, you know, I, I think, think there are ways to address this, but I don't, I don't, I don't know if it's, it's ever going to go, go away. away. Okay. Yeah. Um, um, I mean, it's just something I mean, it's just that, something I that, that I know that I know they've been dealing with for a few years. years. I know some states, know some states are, states are changing, changing rules and laws and, laws and doing, doing some different things to fix that, which should be interesting to see how those play out, I guess. So, so. Yeah, that yeah, we're, that seeing, we're the seeing the same thing. thing. I think, again, again shortening, shortening that cancellation, cancellation window, window, possibly, possibly imposing, imposing additional fees, fees and penalties, and penalties. You, know, you know, will, will help deter behavior, behavior, but it's, it's not going to allow it. So do you get involved, Jeff, with the uh, electric, electrification of, uh, of RVs and, and what facilities in the national parks are going to be doing to, to uh, be able to handle the EVs? Yeah, yeah you, know, you know, it's, it's an interesting question, Mike, and something that um, has – continue to evolve over, I would say, probably the last five years. Um, you know, the congressional push on EVs is a real um, is a real issue that everybody's trying to understand and deliver the right solution to. Um, you know, many of the EV manufacturers and providers are willing to provide EV charging stations free of charge, uh, especially in, in, in national park settings. Uh, there's a lot of partnerships out there that are willing to fund the cost of EV um, charging stations to expand the inventory. inventory. Um, but, uh, you know, the biggest challenge I think we what face is, is you know, where do you put them? them? How, How many, many do we need? need? And, what and what is the underlying environmental, environmental process, process to, to get them get approved, approved so that we can put them in place faster? Yeah, yeah. Um, um, do you do anticipate... You anticipate a quite a bit quite of a bit EV of infrastructure, infrastructure work over the, over the next few years. Well, well, yeah, I think yeah, it's, I think it's only increase. Increase. Um, you know, you as, know as, as, as our government, government continues, continues to push, push clean energy, energy. Um, the Park Service has a mission, mission for resource protection and sustainability. And sustainability. I mean, that, that mission aligns with, with the direction, direction of this clean energy, energy, energy. So, so I think I we're think only going to see abandoned 
innovation, innovation relative, relative to, to alternative, alternative energy, energy sources, sources costs, our, facilities, our facilities, our transportation, transportation systems, systems, our operations. Our operations. I, I, I think, think it's think just it's inevitable. inevitable. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, I think well, that's I think about that's all the time we had today, 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 Jeff. Uh, thanks, uh, for, thanks joining for joining us, us on the show. On the show. Um, um, it's always great, it's to, hear always great to hear updates, on, updates the on the public side of things. Side of things. So, and so, how it relates how to it the relates private to sector. Private sector. So, so. Really appreciate, really appreciate you. Thank, you. Thank you very much for having me, Mike. Mike, always a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, thanks everyone well, thanks for watching, everyone for watching and, and we will be back again next week. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you for listening to WCM's Park Update, a production of Woodall's Campground Magazine. Join us for a new show each Tuesday at 3 p.m. Eastern on Facebook, YouTube, and wherever you listen to podcasts. Follow us on Facebook and LinkedIn for daily news and updates, and subscribe to our news feed on our website at woodallscm.com. Show hosts are Ben Quiggle and Mike Gast. Executive producers Rick Kessler and Alex Burkett. Copyright 2022, G&G Media Group.